Good morning. Welcome to Reedwood. Friends on site, friends online, good to see all of you. Thank you, Shirley and Irv, for that meditative song, that centering song. Can I see the, uh, the lyrics again? That last slide. I thought that was a really nice meditative thought. Whether a garden small or a mountain tall, new strength and courage there I find. Then from this quiet place I go prepared to face a new day with love for humankind. You know, uh, there's a pattern of ministry that the Gospels bear witness to that Jesus himself uh, practiced, and part of that pattern was solitude, where he would go away early in the morning, and remember they couldn't find him, 
Where's Jesus? Where is he? he? Early in the morning, he's praying. And then out of that prayer, he's able to come and minister and distribute the, love, the divine love to humankind. I've been reading portions of St. Teresa of Avila. And I came across this description. It's almost kind of a, a, uh, uh, a section of praise in her writing. She's just kind of overwhelmed by the love of God. And I thought she used some Quaker language uh, in this writing. Now, Teresa, she would have been uh, uh, writing some you know, 700 years ago or more there in Spain. And she wrote this, I said, oh my God, how infinitely good you are. It is in this relationship that I seem to see you and myself. O oh, joy of the angels, when I think of it, I, I long to dissolve in love for you. I like that. I long to dissolve in love for you. How true it is that you suffer those who will not suffer you to be with them. What a good friend you are, O oh my Lord, to comfort and to endure them and wait for them to rise to your condition. To wait for them to rise to your condition. The hopefulness, the optimism that Teresa has, even for those that aren't there yet. And I think we, we all know someone or loved ones that just, they're not there yet. And sometimes we can despair, and sometimes we can be frustrated why they're not there yet. But it seems like Teresa gives us a word of hope about trust in the patience of the Lord, trust in the Lord's timing, and that the Lord is able to be with them until they arrive where we long for them to be. Well, friends, as we have gathered in the space to wait, to listen, to sing, to share, and to just, well, if anything, just be together. Uh, it's good to be together. It's good to see you. Why don't we take a moment to center down, and I'll open us up with a word of prayer. Let's center, friends. Loving Spirit, we consider this phrase that your servant wrote so long ago, this phrase, to long to dissolve in love for you. To long to dissolve in love for you. May it be a spiritual practice and perhaps a prayer that we can carry with us wherever we go in this moment now, later today when we, meet, when we leave this meeting house, as we encounter people and strangers and people that we know today, perhaps our prayer can be that we long to dissolve in our love for you. Lord, as we have come together, we ask that your presence would be made known, and that our hearts and minds would be open to your spirit, O Christ. We thank you for this meeting, this gathering, and this time, of, this time of prayer. For it's in your name we pray, Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, we're going to go ahead and move into a time of uh, worship and song. Music team, if you want to lead us.
It's been insightfully stated that prayer is the heart's sincere, sincere desire. Prayer is the heart's sincere desire. Psalm 40 beautifully describes the heart reaching out to God for strength and God reaching out to the heart. This morning, Angie Gonzalez will be sharing with us from Psalm 40.
I waited patiently for God to hear my prayer. And God <laughs> bent down to where I sank and listened to me there. And God raised me up and set my feet upon a rock and put a song on my lips. Great wonders you have done, O Lord. I bow in gratitude. Angie, thank you so much. And I couldn't help but, as you were reciting that psalm, I couldn't help but think of Pastor Mario, him looking down and smiling and just his heart being warmed. Amen, Latino friends. Amen, friends. Wow, that was so special. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, uh, music team, for leading us in those centering songs. And so we can come to this time uh, collected and ready to receive. Um, we have a guest speaker here today that was uh, referred to us from our friends there at uh, Portland Seminary at George Fox. And um, just really, really delighted to meet you, Drew, and to share you here uh, with our group. Drew is a project coordinator for the group Science for the Church, Science for the Church, and the lead editor of the weekly email of, uh, of that ministry. In addition to leading this project, he does freelance work on a range of projects, including, <clears throat> including Science for Seminaries, Orbiter, Orbiter Magazine, and programs at Fuller Youth Institute and Biola University. Previously, he, stent, he spent more than 10 years with the John Templeton Foundation there in Philadelphia, there where you've also encountered Quakers there on the East Coast, and uh, was uh, pleased to hear that. For recently leading the Religious Engagement Department where he developed programs helping religious leaders and media engage scientific content, engaging scientific content. Drew studied literature and physics at Northwestern University before attending Princeton Theological Seminary where you earned your MDiv. Drew's vocational passion is to help the church navigate faith, the faith and science interface. Drew lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with his wife who is also a Presbyterian minister and your th uh, with their three daughters. So, welcome, Drew. Welcome to Reed Wooden. We're excited to have you. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. Greetings from that other coast where I flew in late last night. So this morning, I want to do science for the church. I want to put science in conversation with faith and talk about the theme of humanity. I loved the, the end of that opening music, the love of humankind. I think that resonates a lot with what I'm going to say today. So I want to begin at the beginning, Genesis, beginning with day six in Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and following. And I'm going to read this to you from Eugene Peterson's translation of the Old Testament, the message. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to the church. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. So they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, 
reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. God looked over everything God had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, day six. There's a lot in this text about our common humanity. God created us. There is something like God that's in us. God has granted us a great responsibility. And God's blessed us in following up on that responsibility. This morning, I want to focus on two of the many themes that are here, unity and uniqueness. Let me begin by stating the obvious. This story was written for the Jewish people. It's passed down to us through Israel's great scribes and scholars. But this story is not exclusively about the Jewish people. It's a story about the creation of all the earth and all of the people that are upon it. So when God speaks, let us make human beings, God is speaking about all of us, no matter our age, our race, our gender, our ability, our socioeconomic standing, our political affiliation, or anything else that we use to divide ourselves. God made every one of us, and there is something like God in us. One of the great moments in science happened in the year 2000, and a Christian geneticist, Francis Collins, was standing at the elbow of then-President Bill Clinton. They were celebrating the sequence of the human genome in the year 2000. And Bill Clinton used these words to describe that moment. I believe one of the great truths to emerge from this triumphant expedition inside the human genome is that in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% the same. I hear echoes of Clinton's words in this text in Genesis and in other texts in scripture like Galatians 3, chapter, tw or chapter 3, verse 28 where Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. A common humanity, unity that comes in Christ and unity that is found in our biology is what both scripture and science are telling us today. But it wasn't always that way. And sadly, for some, it still is not. Biologist Joseph Graves, Jr., one of the first African-American geneticists in the United States, notes that Americans routinely conflate socially defined and biological conceptions of race. Conflate socially defined and biological conceptions of race. They are not the same thing. Why? Well, because race is not a category that can be explained by our biology. We see external variation, we see differences, and we impute biological significance to them. There's an entire history of scientific racism that looked for differences and imputed significance biologically to divide us. But here's what we now know from the genome. We know there's more genetic variation in one group of chimpanzees on a hillside in Africa than among all the humans on the face of the earth. We are 99.9% .9 the same. Let me unpack this a little bit more because this idea that race is not explained by our biology is complicated and I, I want to offer two anecdotes that I think will be instructive. 
First, let's consider filling out a census. What are the categories of race that we use? And I want to compare it to Brazil as a counterexample. So in Brazil, when you're given the census, you can select from the following five categories. They have white, pardo, which is a term that we would probably translate as biracial. They have black. They have yellow, what we would use call Asian on our census, and indigenous. They have five categories. Children of parents, one who would identify as white and one who would identify as black, most of us, I think, would assume would identify as biracial. That's not necessarily the case in Brazil. There are biracial families, one white parent, one black parent with three kids, and one child identifies as biracial, one identifies as white, and one identifies as black. Biology did not determine how these categories were devised, and biology does not determine how we answer them. Race is socially defined. All right, let me offer the second anecdote. This one's going to require a little bit more imagination, and this one's going to get a little bit more at the biology. So pretend with me some super smart aliens come to Earth. We finally discovered life, or maybe they've discovered us. They come here, and we're like, you guys are really, really smart. We're going to ask you to settle this question for us. Tell us, what are the races you find within the species Homo sapiens? I imagine they would first begin to look, what is race? How do we define them? And they'd look and they'd see this huge variety in how different cultures, different nations define race. And they'd quickly realize they need some more objective measure to determine what are the races of human beings on planet Earth. I expect unless they know some biology that we have yet to discover, they'd end up at the genome. And this is now biology that we can do. And here's the results of what they would find. There are five races if you try to use biology to define races. There are West Africans, East Africans, North Africans, South Africans, and then everybody else. If we try to use biology to explain race, to find difference in that 99.9% .9 that we share, that's what we get. Four different groups in Africa and everyone else. That's not the way we understand race in America and in most other places. What I don't want you to hear me say is that race and racism can't impact our biology. Race does impact all of us. Consider health differences. Those are the results of people living under the, the difficulty, the challenges of racism. There's a new science called epigenetics that is telling us now that experiences of trauma can be passed down from one generation to the next. Race very much can impact us physically, can impact our biology, even though race is not rooted in our biology. And so I find here an interesting connection between our faith and what science is telling us in this unity of our human species. And I believe this may support the work that it appears you are doing here at Reedwood Friends and that I find in many, many other churches across the country. I read on your website a statement of concern written in 2020 that we at Reedwood Friends vow to openly oppose and peaceably work to dismantle the forces of racism that would bring harm, physical, emotional, and spiritual, against our neighbors of color. You're trying to dismantle racism here. You're trying to address these concerns. And it is my hope that where science and scripture come together on the unity of our species, that all of us are 99.9% .9 the same, that science may support some of the work that you're doing. All right, let me tackle that other topic. It's a much bigger one. I'm going to do it very quickly, that topic of uniqueness. 
where God says, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. Are humans unique? And if so, what is it in us that makes us unique? This is one of the most interesting, fascinating, bountiful areas for dialogue between science and scripture and faith. There's a banquet table full of ideas and proposals on all sides. It's wonderful stuff. For those of us that like to geek out on ideas, this is, this is the banquet table we like to spend some time at. What's interesting, though, is that surveys done of scientists, most of whom are not people of faith, seem to agree with many people of faith that humans are indeed unique. They don't always agree on how we're unique, but they agree that we are unique. Let me take the, the most strong example I could find, and that's Richard Dawkins. Does anybody here know the name Richard Dawkins? He's known for his atheism and a biology popular writer. He wrote in his classic book, The God Delusion, uh, not The God Delusion, that's the other classic book, The Selfish Gene. Let me find my quote here, there we go. He wrote in that book that we, humans, are built as gene machines and cultured as meme machines. This is the argument he's making about how genetics kind of determines who we are. But he says, we as humans are built as these machines, but we have the power to turn against our creators. By creators, he means our genes. And then he continues, we alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of our selfish replicators. This is another phrase he's using for genes. So we alone as humans are unique in that we can rebel against our genes. We're the only species Richard Dawkins claims that of. So even a staunch atheist, totally against religious faith of any sort, argues that we are unique in some way, shape, or form. All right, so we begin with that basis that we are unique, and then all the disagreement comes. How are we unique? Is it bipedalism? Is it the fact that we walk on two feet? Is it our opposable thumbs? Maybe it's consciousness or rationality or language. Some suggest it's tool use, or maybe at a slightly higher level, creativity. Or maybe it's the way we use symbol, symbols and symbolic language and, and art. Maybe it's a little more general than that. Maybe it's culture, the way we create culture and the way we pass it down. Maybe it's how we relate to one another, the way we cooperate and the way we socialize. Perhaps it's something to do with love, the way we show empathy and compassion and even altruism. And still others, including some scientists, would suggest maybe it's our religious or moral sensibilities that is what makes us unique. Huge array of ideas. What's really interesting, in the last several decades, more and more we're finding that just about everything I just mentioned can be found in some simpler form. You might call it a prototype in another species. So these things do not appear to be completely unique to us. So for example, we share a gene with songbirds that helps them to sing, and it's the same gene that helps us to speak. Corvids, crows, I assume you have some crows here in Portland. There's incredible examples of how crows will make and use tools to accomplish things. Google it, there's some pretty cool videos out there. Primates and many, many other animals will show compassion. The, the classic example is two chimpanzees or bonobos fighting, and the one that gets comforted afterwards is the one that loses. That's the one that gets groomed by the group, the show of compassion, of empathy. And there's even now some evidence that chimpanzees and elephants show some sort of religious sensibility or ritual behavior. There's a fascinating video of elephants that appear to be mourning the death of a member of their family group. Fascinating stuff. And so it leads to this question, are we, diff are we unique in kind? Is there something completely different about us? Or are we just different in extent? That is not a question Genesis answers for us. 
That's a, that's a layer on top. It's a fascinating question. And I think the Bible and our understanding that we are made in God's image, that we are unique in that way, can help us a little bit. I doubt the image of God that we all have is that God's walking around on two feet or that God grasps items because God has an opposable thumb. I think we can probably rule that one out. And I think if we read the corpus of scripture, we see a lot about love and how we relate to one another and how we relate to God. And I think somewhere in that realm may be closer to the truth in what the image of God, what makes us unique. But it's interesting that the Bible never says we have to be fundamentally different in kind and not extent. And so here is another place where I see some connection between science and scripture. We are made of dust, Genesis 2. All of life we know from science is made from the things of the earth, from dust. And we also know from genetics, we all share genes. 50% of our human genome can be found pretty much in every other form of life on this planet. We share a lot in common. There is a deep connection between unique humans and the rest of creation. So unity and uniqueness. These are two places where I find this incredible agreement between science and scripture. And they're not the only two places. I could go on and on, but Mark said you've got a, a time limit here. You're not preaching to a Baptist congregation. You can't go for 40 minutes. So I limited myself to two. But if we're speaking, and if we're speaking honestly, there's also some points of tension in here. There are places where science and faith are going to raise points of tension for us. But I don't think we should be surprised if we believe the most basic message of Genesis 1, that God is creator, and if we believe that scientists are the ones that are studying the natural world, the ones that are studying creation, we shouldn't be surprised that there's lots of points of agreement there, and that there's lots of ways that engaging science can enrich our faith and support the work we are doing in our churches and our meeting houses. This, my friends, is what Science for the Church is about. It's about finding these points of connection, helping the church to understand them, and helping to strengthen the church through this interaction. And so my hope is this little foray that we've done today might spark your imagination. What are some things that Reedwood Friends is passionate about, things like dismantling racism, where you can bring science to bear and help strengthen the work of this congregation. And my prayer for you is that you will be able to do that and that you will benefit greatly from it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drew, for that message, those examples, and just how marvelous uh, the God of creation is, our creator, how marvelous that is. Uh, and to be able to see these things with a new lens and to think through some of these uh, points of tension that even today, even this week, has come up with, um, you know, in our society. This is a pattern that we're seeing, and yet, uh, the scriptures attest our, our Christian faith and Quaker testimonies attest to, uh, uh, not to difference, but to similarities and to connection points. And uh, I think that's, uh, that uh, the ideas of connection is something that we at Reedwood are indeed uh, moving towards and, and, and seeking to answer, whether it's our forums whether it's uh, even our, our outings there with uh, creation contemplation, we're, we're, we're seeking to, to connect and to affirm that unity that we have with one another, uh, with ourselves, with our creator, and with the creation. I'm wondering if we could just center down and see what rises uh, among the meeting and uh, see what uh, perhaps if you feel so led uh, Spirit may have you say to the meeting, uh, if it is indeed for, uh, for others. Uh, those of you online, if you feel so moved, 
by spirit, make sure that you're unmuted so we can hear you. But uh, let us, uh, let us uh, attend to that inward teacher, Christ. And uh, if there is any word that rises uh, among the meeting, feel free to share as we sit with uh, this message and presentation by our dear friend, Drew. Let's center down, friends. I see your hand there, Carla. Yeah. I wanted to say that Dad had his 92nd birthday this week, yesterday. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we're very delighted and we're. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear D. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and a minute more. Oh, man. Amen. Happy birthday, Dee. Thanks, friends. Thank you, Shirley, for that, that, that improv. Man. All right. We did plan that. No, not really. <laughs> it just went too smooth. <laughs> let's, uh, let's have a concluding prayer. God of all creation, we have heard your voice in today's meeting. We have heard it in the songs, we have heard it in the prayers, we have heard it in the message. We have heard it in the silence. We have heard it in our celebration of one another. And Spirit, thank you for stirring us to that question of humanity the shared identity, and to share in the life and the spirit of Christ. Lord, to know you, to walk with you, is to be, is to be human. Lord, we thank you for just the sign of Jesus, that God, that you too understand the human story and that you chose to be there. That's where we encounter you. Lord, may we continue to ask good questions. May we continue to wrestle with, uh, with wisdom, with knowledge, but may we also uh, find a place uh, of comfort uh, in your mystery. All of these things are gifts that you give to us and we say thank you as we receive them with, up, with upturned open hands. Thank you for being in this place, dear Lord. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.